So good morning, everybody. My name is, can you hear me? Yeah. My name is Carl Meacham, and I'm the director of the Americas program here at CSIS. Um, today, uh, I'm honored uh, to welcome Jorge Quijano. Uh, Mr. Quijano is the CEO of the Panama Canal Authority, uh, the organization that manages the Panama Canal. Um, he's had a long career uh, with the authority, and he is shepherding the canal through the final stages of its massive expansion project. Uh, and that's uh, in, in large part why we are here today to talk about this. Uh, this past August, uh, the Panama Canal celebrated its 100th birthday. And when you think about that, you think about uh, 1914, August 15th. But for me, the, the, the first images or, or memories that I have of the Panama Canal are with uh, uh, David McCullough's fa famous book, The Path Between the Seas, and, and looking at sort of the beginnings of the Panama Canal, uh, what it took to build the Panama Canal, and, and to think about that image and think about where we are today is really sort of a testament to, to progress. Uh, and it makes it so, so uh, great to be here with you today. Um, for the past century, the canal has fundamentally shaped the, the very nature of commerce in and through the Western Hemisphere, and the expansion will only add to that. Uh, the Panama Canal's expansion is set to overhaul the way business is done, both here in the Americas and around the world. Uh, the expansion project involves building deeper channels and immense new locks within the canal, enabling commerce and shipments uh, um, going through in a way and in a volume that we've never seen. Energy, water, grain, all of these uh, are poised for significant shifts with the opening of the canal's expansion. And the US and China will probably uh, likely feel the impacts more than anyone else, um, with both countries big spenders on traded goods and, and, and that use the canal in a big way. Um, as its uh, shipments of US grain, the energy resources through the canal are increasing. Just a couple of statistics in 2014, 48.6 million metric tons of grain most of it produced in the United States, moved through the canal from the Caribbean to the Pacific side for shipment uh, to Asia, an increase of more than 50% compared to 2013. Shipments of petroleum liquids from the Caribbean side to the Pacific, most of them refined and processed along the US Gulf Coast, reached 32 million metric tons in 2014. Uh, coal and coke shipments, principally from Colombia and eastern U.S. coal fields, totaled almost 14.3 million metric tons. And I could go on and on with the statistics uh, of the volume and the movement of products and goods through the canal, uh, which is just proof uh, of how vital uh, this canal is to trade, uh, not just regionally, not just for Panama and the importance for Panama, but also for the United States and other parts of the world. So. Um, uh, as we move forward, uh, I, I think it's important to sort of note uh, what's coming. And I know you're going to elaborate more on this, but um, hopefully we can develop more conversation about this. But the issue of light and natural gas, LNG, is particularly interesting uh, as it comes along uh, with the canal's expansion. Uh, the huge locks will enable LNG carriers and other large vessels passage uh, through the canal that couldn't uh, be accommodated before. And that will likely amount to real increase in LNG, propane, petroleum, and coal shipments from the US to China and the rest of Asia. Um, in the meantime, and these are introductory comments and very quick, there are some issues that are out there that are challenges uh, that I think the canal is dealing with. And I look forward to hearing your views on this. The issues, at least aspirational at this point, with a uh, Nicaraguan canal and the possibility of that. Love to hear your views on that. Um, and uh, what that means, uh, or what that could mean in so far as impact. Um, what does it mean? Um, uh, does this mean that uh, trade that now is occurring through the canal, or could occur through the canal, that if there was another option, it would actually be used? I don't know. Um, but I'd love to hear you talk about. Still, uh, the future of the Panama Canal is a bright one, and I'm happy to have Mr. Quijano to talk to us about that here today. Um, so we're going to move on to his remarks. Uh, I would remind all of you that uh, we are on the record. Uh, after uh, Mr. Quijano's uh, presentation, uh, I'm going to ask him a couple of choice questions. 
uh, and uh, we'll open it up to to uh, folks in the in the audience. So, without further ado, thank you, Mr. Kikano, for being here, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, and. To, I'm glad to be here and uh, share with, with you not only uh, I really want to talk a little bit about the expansion uh, towards the end. I was telling Anne, who have met before and in other more technical uh, meetings uh, over the, in the United States that, you know, we'll see less hardware and more of the business of the Panama Canal in this meeting. And um, you have gone over fairly well what I'm going to cover. Uh, but I want to give you a, a backdrop of what's a Panama Canal from a business standpoint. What, who do we tend, who, uh, uh, what do we pass through the Panama Canal, and what the opportunities are there for the future growth of the Panama Canal. And, and to do that, I have to go back a little bit in history uh, uh, with regard to the transits and, and the passage of uh, how, how the traffic has evolved over time. And how vessels also have grown in size. As you see here in this, in this slide, you know, after we reached uh, 1965 or more or less, we, we reached like the peak of numbers of transits and we continue to grow uh, basically the ships so that we could handle more tonnage. And, and as you see, even during the periods of wars and so on, yes, we've had our peaks and valleys, but we've always uh, recovered from those. Uh, we recovered from from 2007 and eight, as, uh, eight and nine as well, and and yes, we've been bumpy. And I would say that that bumpiness uh, uh, has been created by really the United States, who is our main customer. And you'll see that in the next few slides. So, if if the U.S. does very well, the Panama Canal does excellent. Uh, when you're not doing too well we survive. And so we're always hoping that the, the U.S. grows at, at the rate of maybe 3% because that's very good for us. But we can survive fairly well with a 2% growth. Uh, what we cannot do is have you uh, not uh, grow uh, at all because that really has a significant impact on the Panama Canal. So you do well, we do well plus. <clears throat> what is the canal is not as important as what, what is Panama. Remember, it's a location, location, location. And what we have in Panama is, of course, we know the canal is there, and we have uh, the Panama's Maritime Cluster actually services 144 maritime routes. Uh, it services 1,700 ports in the world and 160 countries. So it's not just the United States, but it's that exchange that mostly is with the United States that is important. But also in the la latter years, we've also uh, grown to uh, in the air connections. Actually, uh, for the first uh, first time, uh, I haven't been in, in DC for a long time. And um, uh, first, I've been around the United States in many places, but not in DC uh, for maybe about 10 or 15 years. And uh, come close to Norfolk, that's as far north as I've come uh, lately. But, you know, one of the things that's important is that the, the connectivity of Panama now has been enhanced also by air. And, and as you know, with the internet and so on, everybody wants to have their stuff the, the next day. So air connections together with the maritime connections become a very important asset. And, and the best place to have those interconnections is in a central location. And Panama's uh, geographical position in the Americas make it the best place to do business from if you're going to attack the, uh, basically the Americas. So uh, this is what we bring, what, and what we're trying to do with the expansion is actually achieve that full potential uh, of the geographical position of Panama. So I'm not pushing just the canal, I'm pushing Panama, because it's all about Panama. In the end, uh, the canal is one of the main engines of, of, of Panama's economy, but it, it, it is also, it serves itself from having good ports. It also, there's a synergy there. The more port capacity that you have on both sides, Atlantic and Pacific, the more you will draw of these post-Panamax vessels in the future. So uh, it's important for us also to keep growing on the infrastructure 
on the water side as well on the land side. The main routes that we serve, uh, you see here, Asia, east coast of the United States. That's our mainstay. That's what brings in most of the revenue. And we also serve west coast of South America, east coast of US. These are in order of, uh, uh, of, of relative importance to the canal. We have the west coast of South America to Europe. So Panama, uh, or the Panama Canal, depends a lot on how the main economies around us are doing. Not just the United States, but also Europe. So in, in, a, in a period where you have Europe down and US down, the Panama Canal suffers tremendously. West Coast Central America to East Coast of the United States and South America intercoastal. Uh, those are our main, our main routes, those that, that we serve uh, primarily. But the most important part here is the countries that we serve. And of course, 69% of all of what goes through the Panama Canal either originates in the United States or is destined to the United States. So the United States continues to be, actually has grown. It used to be like 65%, maybe 10 years ago, it's now 69%, it's, 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 uh, has grown to 69% for the Panama Canal. Number two is China. And of course, that's the, the exchange. Is, is, so don't try to add this because it won't add. Uh, uh, the, the idea here is that you see that exchanges between economies. So China, uh, a stronger China, a strong US, and a strong Europe will give excellent uh, results for the Panama Canal. But in the recent, I would say, but recent 10, 15 years, we've seen Chile's economy, of course, uh, growing uh, very well. And that has also uh, brought Chile into the big picture of being in the top three uh, customers of the canal, with Japan sliding from being the number two uh, about 15 years ago to being now number three, but still a strong user of the Panama Canal. And I must stress here that even though they're number three, when you put all of the lines together, the Japanese lines, they are the number one. And actually, right now, the number one customer of the Panama Canal as a line, per se, is NYK. So it's, uh, Japanese is, uh, Japan is also a very important customer of the canal in that sense. Now, you see uh, Colombia starting you know, with a population of about 40 million and a lot of consumption and also a lot of export has, has become number five, uh, South, South Korea, uh, number six. And, and now let me take you over to uh, the segments that we serve, because you know, it's, it's easy when you only serve one segment of, uh, of, 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 the, of the vessels, but when you have to service all of the segments and they all have different preferences, that makes it even more difficult the way we run our business. So over years, if you look at the little circle that I put there, uh, the canal used to be mainly a dry bulk canal, which meant carried grain, carried, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, coal uh, from the United States uh, uh, over to Asia. Uh, it, and in 1999, it started, you know, we, we saw the trend uh, of the container business going up. Actually, if you lo looked at all of our annual reports and you go back to 1990, Containers were not even reported in our in our in our in our annual reports. It was basically 1991 onward that it started to move up. But in 2001, the most important part here to say is that that's when the the China joined the World Trade Organization and the globalization really took off. And that's you see the trend in the container business going up all the way to 2007, uh, picking out up there and then of course, coming down because of the uh, global economic situation, starting to uh, pick up again, uh, sliding down in 2014 slightly. But dry bulk over time has started to pick up. And this is very important, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, you mentioned the fact that a lot of grain goes out of uh, through Panama, and, and that's a fact. And liquid bulk, we will see liquid bulk, and which includes also gas, will also be a part of our new business uh, strategy uh, as, as we move along. 
So you see where our revenue stream is. Container business is number one. 48% of all of the tolls paid to the Panama Canal comes from the container trade. Uh, second to that, with only 21%, is dry bulk. So that's how important the container segment is to us. And that is why, and I focus on that because that's when we had to pick the size of a lock uh, to determine who to, to really uh, stress who we would serve, we went to the container segment and we picked uh, a, a vessel size that would render the best revenue stream in the future, uh, tending to that container segment. The container segment, of course, uh, is a line service. They, they run on a schedule. They know what ports they have to hit w in a particular time. Uh, and a service is, uh, at least the way we uh, have it in the Panama Canal, is we'll have a ship. One service means one ship going north. Remember, Panama is, is, is serves the Atlantic and Pacific, but uh, it actually curves around like an S. So to us, is north and south. West is south, north is east. So, so we say going north is really going to the Atlantic. And so we have one ship going to the, to the Atlantic and one ship coming to the Pacific per week per service. And what's important to that is that we have 30 services right now uh, of all over the world, as you see, that, uh, that come through the Panama Canal. And each of those services, on average, with to that, today's sizes of vessel, is around 40 to maybe $45 million of revenue. So that's how important this segment is to the Panama Canal. Now, but together with that, and that's why I emphasize Panama's connectivity and not the Panama Canal's connectivity, is the fact that from Panama, you also have feeder services. And these feeder services not only go regionally, they actually also feed into Europe and feed into Asia. And, and, and when you go here, you see the Atlantic uh, Atlantic feeder services, we have 24. On the Pacific feeder services, we only have 11. One of the reasons is because we do not have enough, uh, the reason is, is, is low, is we, we, not, we do not have enough uh, capacity on the Pacific side to be able to, uh, to, handle, uh, to handle the additional uh, potential that's there for feeding services on the Pacific end. So we have 35 feeding uh, feed, feeder services coming out of Panama in uh, feeding all over the world. Uh, so this is very important because we even see a feeder service that ha is a post-Panamax feeder that actually comes from uh, Lazaro Cárdenas uh, in Mexico, stops in Panama, and goes back in, into Asia with a, a 9,000 TEU vessel. And this is done on a weekly basis. It doesn't go through the canal because you can't fit it in the canal. But that's, uh, that's how important that connectivity is. And we expect this to continue to grow now that we can take on uh, bigger vessels. But why we talk so much about the East Coast and Gulf ports of the United States? We, the share of imports to the United States on the East Coast and uh, and the uh, golf ports like Houston, for example, you see how much of that New York, 20, New York, New Jersey, 22% of what's going in through there is going through the Panama Canal. Norfolk, 15%. Uh, Charleston, 21%. Miami, 28%. But the largest one of all is Savannah with 37%. That's how important, and in, in essence, on average, we're talking about 32.6% of market share of what's going to the East Coast. Why we talk about the East Coast? Because that's where most of the concentration of population is. And uh, population means consumption. And so as, as much as uh, we see, uh, we foresee in the future that uh, there's going to be continuous growth in, the, in, in this area. I feel that we've been noticing that, that there seems to be more growth in the eastern part of the United States and in the western part of the United States. And that is good for Panama, that's good for the Panama Canal in particular. I mentioned the choosing of the size of vessel. And of course, everybody says, oh, but there are all the vessels that are being built today that are much larger. And yes, I, we recognize that. Uh, 
we have moved now from about 92% of the world's fleet can fit in width and length in the lock chambers. Uh, we will go to 98% of the world's fleet. And in the container segment, even though they're building the 16,000 and the 18,000 and the 20,000 TEU vessels, we will still, by uh, 2018, when all of those that are being constructed are completed, we'll be able to handle 97% of the 5,669 vessels of the container segment uh, in the new locks. So, it's not that all of them are going to transit through those locks. Uh, we will never be able to handle all of that. But what I'm trying to point out is that, yes, vessels larger will be built, but not in the numbers that will affect the trade that we're looking at. Uh, actually, some of, of the, the 8,000 TU vessels will start hitting the West, uh, the West Coast. And, and uh, we see that, yes, uh, that's, that's uh, a, a clear uh, possibility that that will happen. But there is still the need to cascade down all of the 16,000, uh, the 14,000, uh, which can fit in the in the new uh, Panama Canal lock. So you reach when you're when you are proposing a pro expansion program, you have to determine the size and you have to determine where your point of diminishing returns are. And we figure that anywhere between 13 and 14,000 TEU vessels would be the point of diminishing return for the Panama Canal, making a major investment in the infrastructure that should be able to service uh, vessels for the next 100 years. What that would give us, the expanding the canal to a bigger size vessel, also gives us the, the possibility to have more influence over the areas that we right now uh, have impact over with. We, have, uh, we, we expect that because of the economies of scale, we'll be able to compete with the other, other uh, areas or, or other competitors that uh, service the same customers. So what we see is an expanding uh, of, of that area of influence where we can go more into, uh, into Asia and we can go more into the United States, including Texas. So we would have a, 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 a more aggressive uh, approach to, to our customer base and also a part of the northern part of South America, which, which is very important because there's Brazil, uh, major Brazil exports are uh, coming out on Amazon as well. So what is that all going to get us? You have the main large ships, the post-Panama vessels coming from Asia, going through the canal, but they will stop. Not all of them may stop, but some of them will stop. They will discharge some of the, uh, some of the cargo, and they will pick up some of the cargo. That already happens. 80% of the vessels, that, the container vessels that transit the Panama Canal today make a local port stop to drop off or pick up. So we only see this as growing, and, and, and with the vessels growing, more container transshipment is going to happen. We see this, in essence, being a little bit more like Singapore. Singapore does not produce much, but they are the largest transshipment port in the world, doing 35 million movements, TUs, in, uh, in a year of transshipment. It's not the major producer, because they, they really cannot produce that much, uh, but they have the biggest transshipment port, and we expect to grow significantly in that area of transshipment in Panama as well. We are very f just a few days away to feed from Panama, as you, s as you see here, uh, from Lazaro Cárdenas in Mexico. We're only about three to four days, depending on speed of vessels. Same thing from Callao in Peru and San Antonio, Chile. The big ships will not likely be calling on those extreme ports because you cannot bring in a, a, a 14,000 TU vessel and take it all the way to San Antonio, Chile, fully discharge it, uh, and then fully charge it again, you know, load it again. So that trend of feeding more from Panama is what we are banking on. And we firmly believe that this is going to uh, increase over the next few years after the expansion is completed. We also see population in the United States uh, increasing, uh, maybe not as much as South America, 
but we see uh, South America, and you saw the importance of of some of the our, our custom top customers in South America, and as as we see the population growing to 2030 to 700 million in in the whole of Latin America, we believe that the increased consumption by the growing middle class will also boost how much feeding we can do from, the, from Panama and how much transit we'll have through the Panama Canal. Just so you have an idea, the importance to these other countries, and when you see the United States, is, uh, you know, the maritime trade through, the, through Panama is only 11.9%, but when you look at Ecuador, it's 30.7%, 2084 20, 26.7 for uh, Chile. This is how important the Panama Canal is in their tra maritime trade. So it's not just the US, but it's when you start adding those numbers, it's a significant uh, a potential for further increasing as the population grows. So it's not just the United States, it's also about our, the rest of the region. Though we serve uh, faraway places like Spain, uh, South Korea, Italy, Netherlands, and so on, you see those percentages are much lower. Our mainstay is really the Americas. And you mentioned U.S. grain exports. To us, that is another segment that is very, very important. And uh, total U.S. grain exports were, in 2014, 129.1 million tons. Uh, of that, uh, the Panama Canal served uh, 47.2 million tons, uh, which is 36.6 of that total. That is significant, 36% of your grain exports. Of course, when you look at the relevant areas that we can serve, because you have to, yeah, if you, if you have grain that's going to, uh, to the west part of, of uh, Africa, for example, that will never come to the, through the Panama Canal. And if you're going to Europe or, or Northern Europe or anywhere, really east of the United States, that's not, gonna, that's not relevant to our, to our area. But when you look at the numbers that we can really tend to, we're, we're at 83.3% of what that area that is being served that we are able uh, uh, to, to, to seal off. So 83.3% of that trade that we can uh, only leaving only 17% for others uh, to pick up on, and that's because they use the bigger ships to go through around Cape of Good Hope. So we expect then, with uh, bigger ships coming out, uh, and I'll go here very quickly, uh, grain movements from in, in Neo Panamax vessels, uh, uh, slightly larger going through the Panama Canal, we expect some of those to, uh, uh, that 17% to grow even further. Uh, as we move along with the larger vessel. Also, the fact that we uh, can now have vessels up to 50-foot draft. Uh, this is 50-foot in fresh, tropical fresh water, not, not uh, salt water. So uh, you have to adjust about a foot less than that. That's about 49 feet of, of, of foot of draft in, uh, in, um, in salt water. So this allows this 75,000 dead weight ton vessel that today is a Panamax that can go in the canal, go all the way fully charged, fully loaded, and therefore is, is a new transit coming from the northern part of Brazil. There are potential cold movements, both uh, in, also in New Panamax, uh, using Cape size vessels, but loaded not to 180K, but uh, loaded to about 130, 135, going through the Panama Canal as well. Uh, from uh, the United States, uh, and, but we also see coal movements from uh, Santa Marta in, in Colombia as a great potential. There's, uh, the, there's uh, an, an American company called Drummond, maybe some of you know them. They, they have uh, exploited that, uh, uh, that particular mine there, and they're looking for a, an export through the Panama Canal in a much larger vessel. But you mentioned earlier LNG. Mm -hmm. When we went uh, forward with our proposal to build the expansion, we never anticipated uh, the shale evolution. Uh, actually, it was not at all in our calculations. 
it was something that that wasn't even mentioned. The only the only movements that we saw were maybe uh, uh, LNG coming from Trinidad, Tobago, uh, going to Chile, from Peru, a little bit going maybe the East Coast or Europe, something like that. Very little, hardly anything. Maybe a ship a week or something like that. But that has changed. Uh, and, and you saw the potential that the U.S. has now. And as an export, what we're looking at is now the potential of moving a lot of, of traffic of LNG in this new Panamax vessel, which can carry up to 173, 177,000 cubic meters of LNG from the Gulf ports, Sabine Pass, Lake Charles, going to Japan, going to Korea, going to China, going to Taiwan. These are the main four importers of gas. It's important to note that even though there's investments going on uh, for LNG uh, uh, liquefaction plants, uh, gas liquefaction plants in the US, not all of the investment is American. Uh, the Japanese are very much involved in, in, in the uh, plants that are being developed uh, in, in Lake Charles and, and Sabine Pass. So, and we see yesterday I got a note from Lake Charles from, from a friend we have there. He says, there are two more plants that are now in the schedule to go on uh, line sometimes between four and five years from now. So what we see is a, a, a new business that will evolve from the first year of operation of the expansion to uh, maybe two transits per week to something like in 2020, 2021 to three transits per day. So that's how much evolution we see in this. Uh, and of course, it will depend on, on policies here in the United States of, with regard to, to the export of LNG. But that's uh, what we're counting on, that th there is right now the possibility of a lot of exports of LNG from the Gulf going through the Panama Canal. And of course, we have, as I mentioned, these other two possibilities, not major, but maybe a couple of transits a week uh, coming from uh, uh, Trinidad, Tobago, or coming from uh, uh, Peru to Spain, for example. Um, <clears throat> very briefly now, I just uh, like four slides, I'll talk to you about the Panama Canal expansion uh, and where we are. I'll, I'll show you some pictures and I'll talk about it a little bit more. Where we are is uh, the whole expansion is at 90% complete right now. Uh, we have uh, till about January to be uh, operationally, uh, functionally operating so that we can do some navigation testing. Uh, and we expect to be online commercially in April. That's still, we're moving along very well. These few months have uh, shown good, very good progress. And uh, if we keep uh, this pace, we definitely will be there uh, as planned, uh, as now is planned. Uh, we see uh, the LOX project, for example, uh, is at 87%, uh, going into really more into 88% at this point in time. And uh, this is uh, numbers of, of uh, April, so we are much better at this point in time. And, uh, we, the other main project is at ni basically 90% complete. Which, and this other project, which is much smaller, should be completed by August, which is the connection between the Pas New Pacific Locks and the Culebra Cut, which is the cut across the continental divide that carries us into this big lake here, which is Lake, lake Gatun. So uh, we have worked all over the canal. The canal is 80 kilometers long, 50 miles long, and we have done work on all of that stretch. And uh, we are basically on the home stretch at this point in time. Uh, just so you have an idea, 1939, the US wanted to do an expansion of the Panama Canal. And they, uh, they started in 1939, they stopped in 1942 after they entered World War II. We, it was never re, uh, retaken as a, as a project. Uh, but some of the work that had been done, and you see the little channel there uh, at the end here, this, this, this channel is part of that digging that they did. They actually did about uh, 14 million cubic meters of excavation for that. And this is what it looks today. 
So it has changed significantly, <laughs> and we are almost done. Actually, we're putting in, uh, this is on the Atlantic side, and we're putting in the pipe here that has already been placed since we took this picture. But this excavation is to start the filling. The plan is to start the filling of the locks, which it takes about nine weeks to do. Uh, we start from the lower end, filling the lower end from the top, but we fill up the lower end, then we go to the middle, and then we go to the upper, uh, and it will take us all the way to August to be fully full, but the, we will begin by mid-June, we'll begin the filling of the locks on the Atlantic side. Why is it so slow? because you have to do the testing of the gates as we go down and the testing of the valves. So you do the, you, you, you fill up first enough so that you can move the gates. Mm -hmm. And once we, we know we move the gates and that works fine and we also control the valves and see how the leakage on the valves are and need to make any adjustment, they have to be done. Once that happens, now you can fill up that chamber all the way to the top, mm -hmm. which then equalizes with the next level. So to do that, you have to make sure that all of the seals on the gates work, work yeah. before you go to the next level. So it takes, it, it, I hope it takes less than that, but we're figuring that uh, the process may take up to three weeks per level. So that will take us into some time in August to be totally filled. We will be removing then what we call the plug, this plug here, uh, so and the other plug over there. So sometime in August, we should be connecting the Caribbean with Gatun Lake. Okay. On the Pacific end, this is what we had in the Pacific that the 1939 excavations performed by the United States. This is what it looks today. It's just slightly behind, about maybe a month or two behind the Atlantic locks, and they will start probably in July, the filling of these locks as well. So uh, that's what we uh, plan for now, uh, and everything goes right then we would have this Atlantic locks done by uh, August for then other testing that needs to be done uh, for the times that it takes to fill and so on. And then we go over to the Pacific, which should be fully filled by October uh, to start then our navigation testing with our pilots and, and uh, our towboat captains uh, to assist the vessels uh, in between January in March, and then going commercial at the end, uh, at the beginning of April of 2016. So, and that's uh, th that's to give you the background, and now I'm open for questions. Of course, you have one question there. I don't know where you want me to talk about that at this point in time, or you want me to uh, wait let, for other questions? Let me just or? ask you a couple questions. I know people are gonna have a lot of questions around here, and I already see Thank some you. hands going up. So, um, just two things. I mean, you've given us a, a wonderful, comprehensive uh, briefing on, on where things have been and where you believe things are going. Um, a lot of folks right now, their minds are on uh, trade agreements in the United States, particularly the TPP. And one of the issues that I, I, I think would be interesting to get your views on if you've done anything uh, that has to do with this is how something like the TPP would impact your business uh, with the expansion. Uh, what does something like the TPP mean for you? Well, you know, we, we always depend on, on, on what uh, agreements you reach. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, as, as, as you have agreements that promote business through the canal, uh, uh, we, we rather those than those that avoid the canal. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think there is enough out there, enough business out there for all of the competitors. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, Trans-Pacific goes to the West Coast, uh, and uh, L, L, you know, uh, Long Beach and, and, and LA are uh, good friends with us, and, but we also compete. You know, yeah. There's an, an environment competition, but we, we stress in the Panama Canal is reliability. And in the container trade, reliability is number one. Uh, you, we, I want my ship to be on a given port mm -hmm. at a given time. Mm -hmm. And we have reservations, a reservation system that takes care of that. A, a, a vessel can be uh, reserved almost a, a year ahead of time if that's what you want. 
we can accept a, a reservation from a year ahead of time on the day that you want to transit. Mm -hmm. And if we don't transit you on that day within 18 hours, we pay you back the reservation fee, which is about 10% of the total transit. So uh, we bank on, on, on being reliable. We're always there for our customer. Uh, and we've seen some, some uh, deviation or, or diversion mm -hmm. of trade uh, because of the, uh, of the problems in, in the West Coast, which I'm glad to hear. I'm always glad to hear that things come to a, to a normal stance. And, uh, but we, we did get some trade uh, coming our way, and um, I hope it stays with us. Uh, yeah. uh, but uh, uh, we're, we're ready for the competition. Uh, we're ready for Suez as well, which is another competitor. Uh, the main consumption, like I said earlier, is in, in the East Coast states of the United States. And we have three basic competitors there. West Coast ports with the intermodal system uh, and Panama Canal and Suez. Mm -hmm. uh, Suez is now a major contender because they can handle the post Panamax vessels which we cannot. So, and the, the building of larger vessels has ca cascaded down the 9,000 TEU vessels. So for us to compete against uh, Suez is very difficult with a, a 4,500 TEU vessel versus a 9,000 TEU vessels. But a few months from now, that's gonna go away. Mm -hmm. And that will now put us in a more competitive environment. And we expect to get definitely some additional tonnage coming to the Panama Canal. But what we believe is that the United States will grow. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're banking on. We're banking on growth that will be beneficial for the West, the uh, West ports, that will be beneficial maybe even for some for Suez but it will be mostly beneficial for the Panama Canal mm -hmm, as well. Mm -hmm. and, and I would just ask uh, the last question, I guess, from my part would be, how do you see uh, the potential for another canal? Uh, the, all the talk that, that has occurred w regarding a possible <coughs> Nicaraguan canal and, and what does that mean for, for the expansion and for... Uh, the Panama Canal in general. I mean, there's a lot of speculation on if it will happen or if it won't happen. Uh, but if it were to happen, what does that mean to you? We're focused right now on actually getting our canal done and getting, uh, let, me, let me do this here. I had a, prof a professor in college that used to say um, in Northwestern, I, I did a, a, a little bit of an update in, in Northwestern, and, and he was more of an accountant. He said, uh, I asked him one day a question. He said, that's a good question. And then somebody else, and, and then he gave a good answer. And then somebody else asked another question. He said, that's a great question. And then I, and I said, why is that great? And mine is just, he says, oh, because I have a slide for that. <laughs> so. <laughs> So I have. So this a, is a great question. So this is a great question. All right, thank you. <laughs> yeah. thank you. So uh, let, let me just address uh, a little bit, on, uh, give a little bit of background. Yeah. The Panama Canal has been in service for 100 years, service, not just construction, been in service for 100 years. We have so much experience in handling all of the different trades. Uh, we are concentrating on our effort, not on what Nicaragua wants to do or may be able to do in time. We have very competitive pricing. Uh, if something like the, the Nicaragua Canal is built as an investment, they'll have a very difficult time to compete with Suez, with the Panama Canal, mm -hmm. and with the West Coast ports. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's, a, that's a definite fact. Uh, so from a, and, and that's what uh, Mr. Wang Jing has been claiming, that this is a private investment. And anybody that puts money in private investment expects a return. I don't mm -hmm. think they want to subsidize uh, the operation. So I'll just give you a very, very short briefing here on, 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 on the Nicaragua uh, Canal. It, it's really a much longer canal than the Panama Canal. It's uh, 280 kilometers versus 80 kilometers. So it's 200 kilometers longer. Uh, in essence, it's uh, also uh, a two, they're going to have two locks just like ours. Actually, they, what they show in the pictures are, are, are pictures of, 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 our, of our own illustrations. Uh, and it is going to undertake a major uh, investment from, not just from the standpoint of 
investment, but also from the standpoint of uh, uh, excavations and dredging. <clears throat> and I, I just give you, uh, because there's the, as much information as out there, is most of it comes like this, mm -hmm. comes in Chinese. So we have to more or less decipher uh, the numbers are, we recognize the numbers, so, so we know that those numbers, what, what they mean, so we end up uh, translating to English or Spanish, and this is what that means. Uh, they want to use route number four, 278 kilometer in length. The width of channels is between 230 meters to 520 meters. Um, channel depth, which then will give us a, a approximate maximum draft of 25.67, which is significant. Uh, and a beam design of 65 meters because they want to go to a 400 dead weight ton vessel to carry uh, a lot of mineral. So that, that's really their concentration. And I assume this mineral is going to China. Uh, when you do that kind of an investment, uh, what they're talking about, and I'll just go very quickly over here, they have to do this amount of excavation. Sorry about that. Somebody is trying to get me here. You notice the excavation that they have to do uh, is 4.6 4, uh, 4 billion uh, cubic meters of excavation plus another uh, almost billion of dredging volume that they have to do. Uh, all of that is going to cost about 60 to 70 billion dollars. Mm -hmm. These estimates we have done ourselves with our engineering staff. We have looked at all of the information that's available and topography and so on, and, and we come out very close to their numbers with regard to, to uh, the dry excavation and dredging volumes. But to put it in, the pers in, in our perspective, uh, let me just give you an idea. During the construction period by the French, they excavated 63 million cubic meters. Uh, of that, only 23 million were we were able, I mean, the, the, the further construction down by the U.S. were able to use. Then during the construction period of the United States, they did 178 million, mm -hmm. bringing that total to about 201 between 1904 and 1914. Then we went uh, uh, and see that we had landslides and, and post-construction issues that we had to resolve. So we had another 70 million all, all the way to 1986. We had canal widenings and deepenings that cost another 123 uh, million cubic meters, leading to 394. And now with the expansion project, uh, we've now reached 549 million. You remember the previous number was 1.5, uh, 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 sorry, five. 0.5 billion. Mm -hmm. This is a tenth in 134 years. Okay, they the problem that that I see is that they want to do this in five years. Yeah. So what does that mean? During the current expansion, we did the best we could do with all of the dredging and all of the excavations being done simultaneously. We did 140,000 cubic meters per day. Uh, and we had all kinds of dredgers, both in the Atlantic Pacific on the lake, and we had all kinds of heavy equipment all over the place. What Nicaragua needs to do in five, to construct this in five years is 3.1 million cubic meters a day. That is one and a half Cheops pyramids per day. Um, that's a factor of 22 times. So I'd leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's more a, a, a question to your mind rather than an answer from me. We will concentrate on getting our business strategy on serving the customer, having uh, uh, being competitive with those that surround us. And if they ever come online, we'll be very competitive and if they have to spend and, it's a re and they have to get a return on the investment of what we calculate would be 60 to $70 billion to actually do this job, can be done, job, they would have to charge double our tolls. So I don't know how they're going to be able to compete with us. So I'd, I'd, I'd leave it at that.
And I remind you, it was a great question. <laughs> so that was a great. Let me go. Let me go in the back first. If, if there's a microphone, and then I'll move it up here. Please identify yourself, or if you just want to use one of the microphones over here, so we can pick your question up. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, sure. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Th thank you so much for some wonderful remarks. And, and since Carl asked such a great question, um, I'd like to move a little further on that one, if I may. I'm Richard Downey from Delphi Strategic Consulting. Um, you made your point, that, and it's, it's well taken that, yes, um, you're focused on the Panama Canal, not the Nicaraguan Canal, as you should be. And you also addressed the point that uh, from an economic viability and competitability standpoint, eh, you know, the Chinese would have a tough time doing that. And they certainly, if it is, in fact, for investment purposes, they want to get a return on their investment. But as we know, uh, most Chinese companies in the private sector are not necessarily totally private. There is some spillover with the government. And so I'm not asking your opinion, of course, but yeah, I'm sure over a drink uh, you are speculating with other officials, with other uh, with your friends. What kind of talk, what kind of speculation do you, uh, do you give to this? If, they, if there's no economic viability for the canal, is it something that, for example, the, China, the Chinese could use this? I mean, I look at the depth of the canal, 27.67, I mean, almost 28 meters. That, as you've mentioned, that's a huge amount. Uh, is this an effort in your speculation, your friend's speculation, um, is this an effort to go around the kind of neutrality? Can they to move, be able to move illegal cargo, similar to what you caught in the North Korean ship uh, a couple of years ago, is what what just is that kind of speculation that you've heard? Thank you. That is a very dangerous question, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to. Uh, that, that's not that's not a great question. That's a very dangerous question. Uh, I I will have to just comment uh, lightly on this uh, because I don't know really what's on their mind of of those that are they think they they are. Proposing that they're proposing this project as one of an investment. I have read the contract with the country, and it's a it's a a, a, a very strong contract for the contractor side. Uh, the only speculation that I could see uh, and, and people have mentioned is the fact that maybe it's a real estate uh, investment more than a canal. And, and, and if you look at the contract, the contract doesn't require them to build a canal in the end. It just gives them access to build a canal. It, it, they can build a canal, or they can build ports, or they can build all of it, or they can build. So where are they going with this? I don't know. Yes, there's a lot of interest of, of the Chinese government uh, through Chinese companies and to invest in Latin America. That's a fact. Uh, in Panama, they just uh, they didn't win the bid, but they went for the second line of the metro. Uh, they came in second uh, with a good proposal uh, uh, with regard to money-wise. You know, so so they're very interested. They have participated in in several of our uh, contracts uh, in the past, and they haven't won. Uh, but they are very capable. They they also uh, have uh, good financial. Uh, 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 a strength, so we see them as good contenders for future projects. And in the canal, they have demonstrated in our canal that they they actually have told us several times, and including about two weeks ago, that they would be willing to construct the fourth set of locks and make it deeper, wider, you know, almost equal to whatever may happen in Nicaragua or not. Uh, and they would fund it too. So uh, not just the construction part, but the funding. So yes, there is a legitimate, uh, your question is legitimate in that sense in that there is a lot of interest from China to uh, concentrate investments uh, in, in Africa, but also in, in Latin America. And we've seen it all over the place. Now, the, the thing with the depth of the canals and the width of the canals is that if you have to charge the tolls that they need to charge, you would rather put that vessel going around Cape of uh, Good Hope rather than putting it in making an investment and putting it through the canal. And there you don't have to deal with any country at all. You're, you're free to move around. 
So that's why we see uh, um, a, that, that the investment has to be something beyond uh, an investment. Uh, so I don't, I don't want to talk any more about, uh, about what I speculate, because it's, we're really not too concerned about what's happening. We keep an eye on anything that could be a competition. And we analyze it, as you've seen. I mean, we dedicated time to do this because we, we, we realized that that could be. Once we determined that, yeah, it can be, but look at, uh, at the numbers, we decided, let's just leave it there. We keep track of what's going on. But we have to deal with the real competition, which is West Coast, Suez. That's what we have in mind. And look for new business. And that's what we're doing, looking for new business. I think the LNG is a great new business for us. And, uh, you know, whether that happens or not, that's something else. That's, that's uh, Nicaragua to handle uh, that situation with uh, Mr. Wang Jing. We, we want to uh, continue to focus on finishing our canal, uh, getting it to be productive, getting our, uh, start getting the returns that we expected from it very, very soon. And, and that's why we, we're planning for next April to uh, have our uh, uh, going uh, operational, but not just operational, but commercially uh, operational at that point in time. But you also specified, uh, in fairness, just to add to, you, to your answer, you, you specified that the specs uh, of the canal, of the Nicaraguan Canal, uh, particularly the depth, is one consistent with the transport of heavy minerals. So heavy mineral. you know, that goes to the whole issue of natural resources and the focus maybe that the Chinese have on you know, creating another option or an alternative to transport <laughs> transport uh, uh, natural resources to China. And, and that's why I mentioned that where are those natural resources? Basically, those natural resources are in Brazil uh -huh. and Colombia. And if you put it on a very large carrier, the 400 uh, they weigh ton vessel, they can, they can go with less cost mm -hmm. going through, through uh, South of Africa than going going through the, any of the canals, even, even the Panama Canal. So uh, we ran that sensibi sensibility study, and, and it gave us those numbers. That, that basically doesn't, doesn't make sense to go to such a large canal, because then taking the ship, a bigger ship, around and not having to pay tolls is, is a less expensive, yep. uh, is less expensive and, uh, uh, experiment. Yep. Yep. That Let me get the gentleman up here. Uh, Mr. Quijano, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Charlie Diaz, uh, representing ABS Consulting. Uh, two quick questions. The first one is on the Arctic, and frankly, I think you did a very excellent job, I think, of, of showing that the Panama Canal Authority is playing to your strengths, and, and you showed graphically how the Arctic may be less of a concern because of the shipping routes that, they, that, that may open up as a result. But if you'd like to comment on that, please do so. The second one is related uh, to climate change, and that is drought conditions. As you know, there are drought conditions pretty serious in California, Arizona, Texas, you know, Southwest. Uh, not that you may or may not have those now, but is, have you thought about sort of the contingency there, especially with the freshwater component of, of the canal? Thank you. Yeah, freshwater component in the canal is very important, and 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 yes, uh, uh, climate change, uh, although not very well defined at this point in time, uh, is something that we have to, to look at and 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 start getting ready for it. So, <clears throat> in Panama, we'll we'll have to start looking not just for the canal because uh, you know the canal is uh, yeah we have a lot of water that's used for for the canal, but. Most of the population of Panama actually gets its water supply, portable water, from those two lakes that we have, Lake Alajuela, which is a higher lake, and, 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 and Lake Gatun. So it is a combined effort. So we have to start looking at other uh, resources, water resources, and, and we have identified a few in the past which we will have to uh, uh, somehow reactivate. But... <clears throat> And, and we see that, yes, droughts uh, do come around. El Nino it's, uh, uh, presents itself um, like to us in Panama like every 10 years. Uh, actually, the last strong El Nino was in 1997-98. If we were expecting it in 2007, 2008, didn't happen. Uh, 
the year before last, it was not a very wet year, but then last year was okay. This year is, is a little bit uh, dry. Uh, we have, even though our, our wet season just started, we haven't had as much rain as we should have for the month of May. Uh, so there is some concern uh, with regard to that, but we do extensive water management to make sure that we always have water for the canal and for the people, or the other way around, for the people and the canal. And so it, to us, uh, the water is very important, water management, even though, for example, we have hydroelectric power plants that we, when we have too much water or we have excess water, we use, use that to, to generate electricity. When we have situations like this where there's less precipitation, we, we do not generate electricity with those hydropower electric plants. We buy if we need to buy, or we generate with our thermal plants, which uh, we have, and we also are part of the grid, so we also sell electricity as part of one of our side businesses is uh, selling electricity. We only consume about 12% of what we actually produce. So uh, water is going to be important to all of us. And uh, in Panama, we're paying special attention to water resources, not just because of the canal, but because of the needs of the people as well. So I, I, I'd say it's something to watch out for. You mentioned uh, the Northwest Passage. Uh, uh, of course, there's a, sometimes there's a confusion between the Northwest Passage and the, and, and, and the passage over Russia, which has uh, evolved. Most significant, most significantly, uh, over the years, they still are challenging uh, passages, uh, especially uh, the Northwest Passage. You may start going into it, but you don't know where you're going to get out of it. Mm -hmm. So, especially on a on a large ship, and and it opens up at the very most three months or two months in a year. It may open up a little bit more, but remember. It gets dark again, and ice picks up again. So it's not a reliable channel, and it has some safety issues as well. So uh, what we sell through the Panama Canal is reliability, number one, uh, together with safety. So uh, that makes this passage, the Panama Canal, a, a more secure passage. Uh, and one that you can count on most of the time. What will happen with Northwest Passage? I don't know, but uh, on, you know, it, it will depend on, on if we are able, as countries of the world, to somehow control our emissions. And one of the things that the canal does is it is less, it's more green than any of the competitors. Suez is four more days of emissions. You go to the intermodal system and you add the vessel, you add the intermodal system, you actually, per TEU, you will be producing more CO2 or emitting more CO2 into, into the environment than going to the Panama Canal. So we feel that the Panama Canal is still a better option, is more co uh, uh, fuel efficient, and it will be more so now with the uh, ex expanded canal, because now you can go to a size of vessel that can carry three times the containers than, than uh, we can carry now. So we would be in a better position to compete from a standpoint of our ecological uh, uh, friendliness. So uh, I believe that that's something that in the future, like we're looking at water, something in the future that all, we are all concerned about is making sure that we use a less amount of fuel and we emit the less amount of CO2. So I think Panama is still a better choice than the other competitors in that respect. Okay, so we're running out of time. So what we're gonna do is we're going to just, I'm gonna take the two questions. Any questions on this side? And three, we're just gonna ask the questions and then you're gonna pick which ones you wanna, you okay. wanna answer. Okay, so we'll start over here. Uh, we'll go over there, back in the side, and then we're, um, I wish there were all questions that you could say yes or no. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> but uh, is it, it's, it's, a, it's up to you. Yeah, okay. It's up to you. And then again, we don't know if they're good questions. So, uh, anyway, but yeah. I mean, we don't have slides for those. Well, yeah, they, yeah. They, they may be good, but not excellent. <laughs> right? we'll, we'll take the questions and then it'll be up to you. So that's it. We're closing shop now. So 
Go. Thanks, Mr. Cano. Uh, I'm Alan Chapel with APR Energy. I wanted to connect a couple of the points you made. One, about the impact of the canal on, Can on Panama in general, about the increasing population in Latin America, including uh, the middle class, and then also the escalation of LNG shipments through the canal. I'm wondering if, the, if all these three kind of coalesce to become a catalyst for uh, LNG drop-offs to, to Panama, making Panama a regional energy hub where you take LNG and turn it into power for the region. Okay, next question. So it's Panama Regional. Question. I'm Mason Leon with the Intermodal Association of North America. My question was also about the rate structure, um, and I was wondering what kind of industry feedback you received during the review process. Thank you. Okay, so that's one question combined. Uh, sir? Um, <clears throat> my name is uh, Frank Hollowell from CGLA Infrastructure, uh, and my question was about the long-term strategy. <clears throat> um, you said that you want it to be a uh, a you know, major transshipment hub, that's your long-term strategy, very much like the Singapore model. Um, and you said there's a lack of capacity on the uh, Pacific side. So what are like two or three projects after the expansion has completed to sort of address that, that lack of capacity? I know that the port of Cortazal uh, is going to be retendered. Uh, there's an LNG, uh, LNG group is, uh, is working on the, on the Caribbean side. But what are three other projects that you might uh, point to which, uh, we, we, that you're excited about? Okay. And the last question? Yeah. I'm Bo Wong from uh, China's Guam Daily. This morning, before coming here, I read a story by VOA. They say, the, com the Latin America experts said that uh, China's uh, proposal with uh, Brazil, Peru, to bid up the railway from the Atlantic coast to Pacific coast might be a very big challenge for Panama Canal. And uh, he even said that uh, Panama Canal might be delayed for the expansion. For the expansion, how do you respond to that? So this is the dry canal, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, the dry canal. Okay. So we basically have, let's say we have four, uh, four questions: um, uh, the issue of Panama becoming an energy hub, uh, the rate structure. Uh, projects that can increase its capacity, and then if the dry canal, um, what 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 kind of challenges would a dry canal provide uh, to uh, to the Panama Canal? On the energy hub, uh, we definitely feel that um, Panama can serve uh, as an energy hub, mostly uh, at the beginning to. Uh, supply uh, bunkering, LNG bunkering, to vessels that will develop that technology. Actually, um, right now there is a, a vessel that, that's in, in uh, the West Coast, in San Diego, uh, being retrofitted and is going to go into service, going to go through the Panama Canal in September. It's uh, operated by coat, and it is going to be servicing from, it's going to uh, Puerto Rico from uh, Jacksonville. Uh, to Puerto Rico, and uh, it picks up its gas uh, in Puerto Rico. So it'll, it, uh, sorry, in in uh, in Jacksonville. So we feel that because of the passage in a central location where Panama is, we could serve as a gas station, just like you know, you remember going back 50 years. You know, you you pick the roads that had the most gas stations uh, when you were driving. You make sure you always had an option of when to fill. Uh, the same thing is here. As, as we develop uh, uh, vessels that will be uh, have proportions with LNG, uh, they will need bunkering stations. And the best place to have them is in central locations. And we are at a very precise location where in the central of the Americas. And, and therefore, someone coming from a long haul or going on a long haul could actually stop and top off or fill up at, uh, at Panama. So that's one, of the, uh, <clears throat> that's one of the things that we're looking at in the future. As you see here on the left here, you see the LNG terminal. It's one of, one of the projects that we're thinking 
that could be developed, but the first phase of that is uh, having the critical mass for energy production. So you need uh, electrical power generation from LNG enough somewhere between three to 400 megawatt to be able to then have enough critical mass to bring in a load of LNG so that you could then from there also bunker. So we see that as a possibility down the road five, six years from now. Um, we've talked to our customers about what they're doing with LNG propulsion systems and what they've said is that they're looking at it uh, and they don't see it for the next five years as a, something very regular. But we'll see some uh, being converted because especially in the, in the container trade, there is a loss of space when you put in the big tanks. So that's, that's one of the, the problems that we see. But uh, I think it is going to take off and uh, Panama is in a very good location to be able to bunker. Uh, uh, we, also, we also look at, uh, you have the rate structures. I, I didn't come prepared to talk about the rate structures that we've done are, are very, very varied. Um, as you saw, we, we have uh, different segments that, that we tender to. And we, uh, for example, we took off, we took the container trade, which is the most important, and we, uh, we charge for the capacity of the vessel, and then we also charge for the amount of containers that are full. And what we and before uh, we were doing like uh, eighty percent of what was full was being charged as well. So now what we've done is we've gone down to sixty percent. In essence, what we're doing in there is we're sharing on how the market actually fluctuates. Uh, so we're sharing with our customer if the rates, if there's a good market and the rates actually go up, we will be able to make more money. So they will be make, making more money as well. But if the rates go down and, 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 and then they have less uh, filled containers going through, we, we will be sharing in, in that, in essence, in that loss as well. So that's a, that's a takeoff from the original uh, rate structure that we had. But we also added a loyalty program where the more containers you put through the canal, the better pricing or the prime pricing that you will get. And that was never in our toll structure before. And what that gives you is uh, trying to keep the top customers, the top liners, the, you know, the MERS, the NYKs, the, uh, all of, you know, uh, Evergreen, Costco, all of those are our primary customers to continue to use the canal and accumulate that Frequent flyer miles. Okay, this is a frequent transit uh, uh, numbers that we're going to pick up from them, and that will give them a better rate, a, a discount. It's not a discount, but it's an incentive uh, rate that is prime and is less than than the, they would if they didn't have it. And we have we have several thresholds. If you pass that threshold, you get uh, a, a a prime rate, and if you pass the next threshold, you get and uh, another prime rate. And we have a set up so that uh, those that are in an alliance, they will get the credit, not for the alliance, but they will get the credit for the ship that is paying the tolls. And that's, a, that's an argument that we've had before because they would rather have it all lumped together. But for us to keep track of whose container is on board is very difficult. So uh, what we've done is the ship that's paying the tolls gets the rate depending on what line uh, how many containers have carried in the past year through the Panama Canal. So uh, I, I want to leave it at that. There are other uh, uh, structures within uh, the different segments that where we have, we're trying to attract, for example, in dead weight, uh, we went to dead weight tonnage and, and the Panama Canal tonnage as well on, on, the, uh, on the bulkers. And we have uh, rates especially to, to attract coal and attract iron ore from Brazil, for example, so those rates are lower than, for example, the grain rates. So that's uh, something that we're doing there. So this is a, a very innovative uh, total concept of, tr of, of uh, a toll structure. But I must, you know, you're saying, well, what's going to happen in the future? I have to be very careful here because this is the first time we've done a massive overhaul 
of our structures. So we have to see over the next year and a half what happens, how, how everything panned out. Did it pan out like we expected it to pan out? And did our customers benefit and we benefit as well or not? And then we may, we'll have to make adjustments. So I don't want to project into the future. Those are the tools that will be in place for about a year and a half. And we'll be reviewing that. And we'll be talking to our customers like we did in this last last uh, few years where we spent almost two years talking to our customers before we come up with a proposal. And just to answer the last question, what were the comments? I would say that 99% of the comments were either neutral or, or, or favorable. And of course, there's always someone that doesn't like to have their toes <laughs> increased. And I can accept that because I don't like uh, toes increased on, on anything that I have to pay toes for. Uh, transshipment port capacity, yes, we, we believe that the Caribbean has enough capacity right now, uh, but the Pacific does not. Uh, we see the potential for Panama to adding uh, additional capacity with the, and you mentioned the Corozal port. Uh, we're still working on that. We, we have some issues that we have to take to Congress, our Congress, and uh, uh, we're hoping to do that in July and see if we can uh, go forward with our original plan. Um, that's for a basically two-phase project that will give us five 5.2 5 million TU capacity additional on the Pacific side. The good news is that uh, uh, PSA has, is now increasing their capacity on the Pacific end. Next week, they'll be actually starting the work on, on their expansion, going from 500,000 uh, TUs to, uh, they believe they can reach 2 million TUs on a on a part of a concession that we gave them, the Panama Canal uh, uh, gave a concession to them or gave, no, they're paying for it. Uh, so I just want to clarify that. Uh, it's a, a concession that we, we worked on uh, for about a year before, and, and uh, so it's uh, good for them. They can expand, and it's good for the canal because we believe it also will draw some additional transits through the Panama Canal with these two births, uh, post-Panamax birth that they will add in the Pacific side. So we, we believe that one additional uh, port will, will enhance the possibilities. Uh, there was also a question of what, other, what else are we doing there. We're looking at a Roro port uh, on the west side of the canal on the Pacific end. We're looking at the further developing uh, all of the land that we re reclaim uh, that was contaminated with the UXOs unfortunately left by the U.S. military when they, they this was areas that were um, used for target practice and they had mortar fire and they had bazooka fire. Uh, and for when we were going to do the, the expansion, we had to go in there and blow everything up, you know, detect what was, uh, what was bad and, and blow it up and then cover it. So now we've recovered almost a thousand hectares that uh, were not available before. You couldn't even walk into those areas. Now we're able to build over those areas and we plan to have a, a industrial park, a free zone area in, in that. And we have actually put out a tender uh, for the master plan of that uh, just recently last week. So uh, th those are the things we're doing there. Uh, and, and very quickly uh, on the railroad uh, uh, between Brazil and Peru, um, you know, we live in a world where there's always competition, and we love competition uh, because it, it makes us boost our efforts and, and do better. And I believe uh, land transportation will never compete with all water uh, uh, services. Uh, all water services are less expensive, and they are less also um, contaminating. So I believe that uh, yes, that's an option, uh, and, and it may take away uh, some business, but I think we are focusing on getting other business that will not go through that route. All, all of the LNG, for example, will not make it through there. All the our LNG exports, those three ships a day in, in 2000 and 2021 uh, are never going to go through there. So uh, it's, a, it's an option, yes, some trade will be there. But as we grow, if the economies continue to grow, we'll grow. So we'll have some competition in the growth, but they will not be taken on the base. 
So I, I, I believe we'll do fine. And, uh, and we are all for, you know, more uh, development in the logistic map of the world. Uh, and especially if they're more efficient. So just good luck. Well, having said this, and, and, and I just want to thank you. You've been more than generous with your time. You've answered every question uh, completely. Uh, so I, I, I want to show my appreciation. Thank you. Thank the ambassador, Gonzalo Sarvilla, for, for bringing Mr. Quijano here as well. Um, it's just been a great session. Um, would you please join me in a round of applause to thank you. Thank you. Thank you.